Getting woken up by a face full of sunlight was something that I had expected to leave behind when I boarded a ship for deep space. Especially since the ship in question was crewed entirely by tunnelers, the eyeless species that gets by on sonar. They hadn't made the ship, but they had customised it, and that included covering all of the big windows with armour, much to the disappointment of the human female who joined them. But it turned out that they hadn't covered the smallest windows. As I blinked and squinted up at the wall that was pouring floodlight brilliance into my room, I discovered that the circle I had taken for, simply part of the wall, was clear. Probably foot-thick plastic or transparent aluminium or some alien material made from space bee honey. Didn't matter. It was letting in far too much light for whatever o'clock this was, and that made it part of the conspiracy. The ship seemed designed to prevent me from sleeping for a full cycle, no matter what I did. On my first night, I found that the original owners had left their morning alarm set too stupidly early. The lights blinked on at the butt crack of dawn and refused to turn off. I'd asked other crew members about it and been soundly laughed at. How could they know if something key to my weird human senses was set in their own rooms? I left it at that, instead digging up a translator module for the language of the hardskins who made the ship, so I could figure out the control panel's advanced settings. There'd been a bookshelf installed in front of the thing. On my second night on the ship, I'd woken in the wee hours to discover that the innocuous tube over the door glowed a worrisome, flickering orange during warp jumps. I turned my bed to face the opposite wall, which is what led to the current, irritating blast of morning sun. I covered my face with blankets, but no luck. The damage was done. With a long, suffering sigh, I threw off the blankets and stared at the ceiling. A spot of graffiti that I hadn't seen before caught my eye. My communication was in reach. I keyed on the translator function and focused it at the alien text. Would it be a warning about the light timer? Maintenance tips about some quirk of the system? No, it would not. The translator displayed, Haha, you can't see this. I grinned. That almost made up for the rude awakening. I sat out to find proper clothes. As I climbed into my favourite jumpsuit in many pockets, the light started to fade. I blinked. No, the light was definitely fading. I zipped the suit and stepped onto the bed, peering out of the porthole. I expected to see a local sun eclipse by an asteroid or a moon, or see signs that the ship was changing course. But the pattern of stars was stationary, and there were no sunsets in view. There was, however, the remains of a distant explosion. I saw the flaming gases spreading out and beginning to be quenched, but a traffic jam of shrapnel flickered in the reflected light. It was all so far away that I climbed down to pour from my duffel bag and searched my telescope. Suitably armed, I hopped back up for a better look. That was most definitely an explosion of a camouflage asteroid base, unless I miss my guess. The kind that store fuel and munitions for the ongoing battle against raiders. Fuel plus oxygen in air combined to make a showy fireball, and while most of the chunks have been launched away for parts unknown, some had collided with nearby space debris and stayed within easy viewing range. They all had the glow of alien tech on the broken side. Something flickered past my focus range, and I pulled the telescope away before looking back. It was a spacecraft, painted black and probably invisible when it wasn't backlit by fire. A pretty distinct shape, though. One long spike surrounded by a ring of smaller ones connected to the base, like a splash of water turned to icicles. Like one of the enemy raiding ships. I scrambled off the bed and out the door, only pausing to grab a forehead light in case more of the being left on for years illumination needed repair. It was good that I did. The hallway panels were intact, but the phosphorescent moss in the one long stretch was finally being cleared away. I kept my exclamations of annoyance to myself as I dropped past the pair of workers. Also, my unflattering opinion of their species appearance. Ever seen a naked mole rat? Then you're halfway there. These guys are a little more civilized. They wear clothes and trim their gnawing teeth and all that good stuff. They also have skin patterned in unpredictable calico splotches, which I am 100% certain they are unaware of. These two were aware of me. They regarded me steadily as I approached, and my verbal, Hi there. They turned back to work. Tunnelers greeted each other with double blasts of sonar instead of a wave and a smile. Saying something aloud was the best I could do. I sighed at the loss of that oh-so-helpful moss and its pale green glow, but put it from my mind. Around the next corner was the medical centre, home to the best lighting of the whole ship and also the closest thing to a friend I'd made in the last couple days. Liddy Hurrant, the lead medic, had agreed to let me hang out and read in a corner after I proved helpful in diagnosing a Scamadurian spear nose bite. The poor fellow's symptoms were the same as a handful of other ailments, except for that distinctive rash, which neither he nor Liddy could see. There were no patients in the front office now, just Liddy organising medical supplies. Her back was to the door. She jumped at my, Hey Liddy, 
Robin, she said, you are uh, so quiet. Maybe you could hum in place of sonar? I think that would annoy everybody, including me, I said, slightly out of breath. Maybe, she admitted, setting down an armload of jars. Are you here with more medical insights? No, I said. Then the jars caught my eye, but half of those have gone bad. What? Are you sure? Yeah, pretty sure. That's a mold pattern if I've ever seen one. You may want to check all of them, but that's beside the point. There's at least one raider ship close by and just blew up something technological. I need you to get me to the captain. The security guards won't listen to me alone. Liddy asked for details and I gave them, talking quickly and making more than a few wild gestures. She probably caught all of them, if previous interactions were any judge. She was probably sonic mapping me continually. Got to keep track of those spindly human limbs and the tendency to move around. When I finished convincing her that my mysterious sense of eyesight, oversmell, had detected a hostile ship of a sort that would be invisible, unsentable, to the folks on the bridge, and we should just destroy something far out enough away that the shrapnel hadn't reached us yet, then she was all set to help me convince the captain. If we were next on the target list, that raiding ship would know that only tunnelers patrolled this region. They'd be counting on the visible explosion to be ignored. They might have allies erring towards us now, hard on the heels of that shrapnel. If the captain had been a different sort, he might have already been using the advanced detection systems that the ship came with. The Harskids had included a translator for visual to sonar, but I'd heard more than one crew member complain about the grating sound of it, and the affront to the tunnel ego, and the fact that it really wasn't necessary when the auto-navigation was exceptional for their plan to blend hops. Surely the radar scanning the path in front of them was enough. There was a tunnel of motto to the effects of dig forward and don't worry about the rest of the soil. That was fine and dandy for social metaphors and relationship drama, but it was about to get us blasted into space dust. We need our shielding up fast, Liddy said, as she ushered me out of the doorway and pulled a membrane from a wall to shut it. This looked like a transparent eyelid, just as gross as you think. She pressed the nanotech control panel to lock the door, and her hand sank past the wrist before withdrawing cleanly. Also pretty gross. Can you detect oncoming ships? She asked me. I grimaced as I followed the brisk pace she set. Maybe. If they happen to fly in front of that fire, or a sun, or I may be able to spot their shadows passing over stars, but I'll have to be looking in the right place. Liddy waved it away. The fact that you know the layout of the enemy lands, sir, despite not having boarded it one or touched a model, should be enough to make the captain listen. He can activate the detection systems of the Hardskins. We have both the technology and the technicians. She made a rude noise. Just not the patience, but you did not hear that from me. Oh no, I'm right there with you. My first and only meeting with the captain has started with the discovery that the lights on the bridge were all dead, except for one flickering exit light. The captain had little patience for his new human with extra senses shuffling forward blindly. My explanation never made it out the starting gate, and the conversation went downhill from there. This time would be different. I had a senior officer vouching for me, and I had valuable information. I also had a strong feeling that Liddy wasn't leading me towards the bridge. Where are we going? I asked. To the captain's home space, she said. He won't be awake yet. I'm only up because I had an urgent case. Liddy shook her head as she hurried along. It was nothing, but I am glad that I was there when you arrived. Me too, I agreed. Then I smiled broadly. And I get to wake up the captain. Won't that be nice? It's definitely his turn. <laughs>